When the psychologist Harry Harlow replaced the monkey's mother with two wire models, one hard, the other soft, he began a revolution in childcare. We joined Claudia Hammond in Madison in the United States, where it all began 50 years ago. When a baby is newborn, it soon turns to its mother in preference to anyone else. And within psychology, it used to be assumed that the reason was simple. Mothers have milk, and that's what babies need most. We all know which side our bread's buttered, and so from birth it makes sense to attach yourself to the person with the food. But Harry Harlow showed it wasn't just the food that was important, but love and affection. We observed these babies that we'd separated. We had to keep them alive. We found it was very helpful to give them some cloth uh, to hang on to. After you saw the intimate attachment of these animals to this kind of contactual need, eventually you could not help but make the discovery that uh, this was a deep and biting kind of bond. His work on inanimate mothers showed that contact comfort was crucially important. We can look at that now and say, well, that's obvious. But at the time Harry did his research, the prevailing traditional view was that mothers shouldn't spend a lot of time in contact with their infants because that, quote, spoiled them, unquote. He transformed the traditional views. Most people have changed how they raise their children as a consequence of the studies done in the 1950s and 60s. They don't even have to take intro psych. They don't have to open up a psych textbook. Educated people around the world are familiar with and behave in a different way because of those discoveries. So coming into the Primate Research Center here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I can see straight away there's a plaque to Harry F. Harlow, 1905 to 1981, saying that this whole building is dedicated to his memory. And above it, there's three pictures of rhesus monkeys, and one of them on the right is a baby monkey with its mother, which, of course, is the crucial thing that Harry Harlow was studying. It's a pleasure to welcome you here, and we are standing in his original office. It's been renovated, changed since that time period, but the room itself is where he worked for most of his career, and as you can see, there are some of his books still. Today, the director of the Harlow Center for Biological Psychology here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison is Christopher Coe. I notice you've got particularly fierce air conditioning in here. Animal facilities of this type are highly regulated now. There has to be much more ventilation, better air airflow to reduce odor and limit disease and so you can hear probably what are the 10 air changes per hour which is um, that sounds quite a lot is that more than humans uh, would uh, as I kiddingly tell the students in my classes when we're sitting in the stuffy old rooms <laughs> um, a more typical air exchange would be one per hour and there are many other regulations of that type about temperature and humidity cage size and on and on there's a box here which shows the actual experiment it's almost like a little theater that opens up a little stage and it's got the two wire monkeys are these the actual ones that were used they're very similar to the ones that were used in the studies but not the actual ones i was expecting them to actually look a bit like monkeys but to be honest they don't really they're sort of wire cylinders so one is just a bare wire vertical cylinder that's leaning slightly back and the other also leans back and it's covered in a piece of terry toweling but i'm surprised that there isn't actually that much difference that the soft version if you like the terry toweling version it isn't softer because after all I've read about this and learning about it as a student I always imagined it was this lovely soft cuddly monkey and to be honest it isn't it is just a wire cylinder with some cloth across it which makes the results all the one more striking Harlow asked our apparatus engineer to build two different monkey models we're very lucky because Helen Leroy has come to meet us and you worked with Harry Harlow for many many years I spent 44 years here and I started with Harlow in 1958, and so I was really with him until he died in 1981. Harry Harlow started his primate laboratory at the University of Wisconsin back in 1932, and it was around the time that Helen Leroy began working as his administrative assistant that he started studying baby monkeys' reactions to model monkeys made from wire, referred to as surrogate mothers. 
It really came about because back in the early 1950s, the monkey colony here was devastated by a TV epidemic. That's why these baby monkeys were separated from their mothers at birth and raised in a nursery. Cloth diapers were put in their cages with them. People noticed that they were clinging to these diapers, and when the diaper was removed from the cage, they would become distressed. Harry Harlow had a terrific sense of curiosity, and so I think Harlow thought, I wonder what we can do to find out about why that's happening. Baby monkeys were put in cages with two kinds of dummy mothers. Both had a light bulb inside for warmth and a bottle which dispensed milk through the chest. With one group of monkeys, the cloth-covered monkey had the milk, and with the other, the milk was inside the bare wire monkey. And the experimenters were soon to discover which mattered most, food or comfort. Harlow had been working with primates for over 20 years prior to the experiment that most people know about and recognize him for. The early part of his career had been focused on learning and cognition and he was quite well known for that work and in particular for the development of certain types of tests which are still used today to measure monkey intelligence. That work on learning was probably the foundation to the experiment we're talking about. There were a number of different reasons for that research, but one of them emanated from the cognition from the learning period, which is how does a baby learn to recognize its mother? How does it learn to become bonded to her? Are they born with this predisposition? What are the reinforcing features? Is it touch? Is it food? Is it smell? He liked to challenge the ideas of others, and I think Part of the surrogate research was that at that time in child rearing, mothers were really sort of instructed not to pick their babies up and cuddle them. That was behaviorism and the idea that you would spoil your children by giving them attention. I think he was challenging that notion also at the same time. As earlier, he had with the learning research in operant condition where he demonstrated that the monkey would do something just because it was curious. This was the heyday of B.F. Skinner, the father of the movement known as behaviorism, the idea that we learn due to reinforcement by reward or punishment. The notion that anyone could be motivated by something like curiosity was revolutionary. And what we knew about classical conditioning after Pavlov's famous dogs began salivating at the sound of a bell predicted that the baby monkeys would prefer the surrogate mother which provided them with milk, regardless of what the model monkey was made from. But Harlow had a hunch that this might not be the case. There'd been experiments with goslings and ducklings as far back as the 1930s, which showed that when it came to deciding on a mother figure, there were other forces at work. There already were the famous studies by the German ethologist Conrad Lorenz. And that's the famous picture of the goslings following Conrad Lorenz around and baby ducks following trains and all of that. So there already was an awareness that animals could sort of misdirect their attachment needs or their imprinting needs in the case of birds towards a member not of their own species or towards an object and Harry Hollow had also crossed paths with a British psychiatrist named John Bowlby who was interested in early attachment and there were studies on children that had been raised in hospitals what was called the hospitalization syndrome and so child development researchers animal researchers Researchers were all converging to think about this question in that time period of the 1950s. The results were striking. The monkeys spent almost all their time with the cloth mother, and if she wasn't the one with the milk, they'd leave her for just long enough to get the milk they needed from the wire monkey and then return. And if the monkeys were afraid, it was the cloth mother they would cling to. The demonstration that the baby will bond, not just hold onto the doll, but that this doll becomes laden, full of emotion. It is mom. So that's one feature that's important. The other is the demonstration that food, which normally in the real life situation is important, a mother holds her child and feeds it and talks to it and all of it comes together, but you can actually dissociate the food. 
you can remove the wire one with the milk bottle and it doesn't upset the baby at all. It doesn't elicit the separation response, the loss, which the cloth one will. If you take the cloth one away, the baby will start to cry. Even if you change the covering, the cloth itself has taken on a bonding attachment significant. I really like this photo here where you can see the, the baby monkey is on top of the cloth mother and his feet are on the cloth mother, but it's reaching over to get the milk next door, but sort of still staying, if you like, attached to the, the cloth one, which explains exactly what you've just been saying. The term Harlow used was contact comfort. Harlow had demonstrated that the drive to find affection is even stronger than drives like hunger and thirst. His research on early experience has had very far-ranging effects and it certainly remains one of the findings of Harlow that you see even today, 50 years later, in introductory psychology texts. Harlow's last PhD student was Melinda Novak, who continued his experiments and is now Chair of Psychology at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in New England. If you look at that particular era, the big issue was, was behavior genetic or was it learned? Which, from our perspective today, is a very simple-minded dichotomy that really doesn't make sense. But at the time, ethologists were arguing that species-typical behavior like maternal behavior like infant development were wired in and innate. And Harlow clearly showed, and I, I believe he knew the outcome from the beginning, or at least had very strong suspicions that social development in primates is crucially dependent upon early experience, that it isn't just wired in. I can assure you that I have every intention of studying the cloth mother and then abandoning this field of research and going back into the area of learning and cortical localization. Harry Harlow interviewed on the BBC in 1965. But a very dramatic thing happened to me, and that is a psychological friend of mine looked me in the face and he said, you know, Harry, you are going to go down in the history of psychology as a father of the cloth mother. Oh. I, I couldn't accept this, so I accepted the only thing I could do and broaden the research, and then becoming totally enamored with the idea that it might be possible to really scientifically analyze all of the whole spectrum of affectional love responses. I think he got great pleasure out of challenging the more staid academic community at the time which was not interested in love because as you might imagine this was largely a man's world science back then studying how baby monkeys fall in love with their mothers or bond to their mothers was not a typical subject. How much criticism did he receive for the studies considering that he was challenging the orthodoxy of, of the time? Very little. He was very well established in his field and I think people really looked up to him. There's a letter here. Dear Harry, congratulations on a very much deserved honour. I won't say I was not disappointed, but I don't know anyone I would rather lose to. Congratulations. Fred. So do you remember who the Fred is in this letter? It's B.F. Skinner. Oh, that's from Skinner. Really? Also, that it is. So this Fred here is actually B.F. Skinner, who's very famous. The so, famous guy, yeah. yeah. Evidence that Harry Harlow went on to be recognised as much more than just the father of the cloth mother in psychology. In his later studies, he reared baby monkeys in complete isolation to find out how they'd cope in adulthood. Not surprisingly to us, these monkeys didn't make good mothers. And Harlow himself commented that by this ingenious research, we learned what had been totally obvious to everyone else except psychologists for centuries. Yet Harlow's deprivation studies, starting with the wire monkeys, did mark a distinct shift in our understanding of the importance of experiences early in life. Inevitably, he's faced the accusation that his work was cruel and even unnecessary. Roger Fouts, professor of psychology at Central Washington State University, is one of Harlow's loudest critics. Harlow's research, although it's famous or, in my opinion, infamous, I don't think it really told us that much. 
if you look at the other attachment research, Bolvi and so on, that before that, that attachment, the bonding is critical. This uh, sudden surprise that you don't want to cling to an uncomfortable cold wire thing, even though that's the only place you can get food. I mean, I might go into, uh, if I'm on the road, stop at a, at a greasy spoon and eat, but just because I'm getting food there does not going to mean that I like the place or I'm going to go back to it continually. Food's critical, but I think with a social critter, and uh, Reese's uh, monkeys, like humans, are social organisms. It's our primary thing. That's what we're all about. That the social attachment at one level is almost stronger than the basic need of food. I mean, if you can't form a relationship, you're not going to survive, either as an individual or a species. The experiments that needed to be done had already been done before Harlow did them. John Oates is a senior lecturer in developmental psychology at the Open University. It was already known the deprivation, not just in monkeys, but in humans, because we already had Rennie Spitz's work on children in orphanages, and we knew that their social behaviour was deeply compromised by a social isolation. So I think the work was being done. Harlow really did it in a very dramatic way, and that's why he's always quoted. Harlow often gets the rap for his deprivation work, but in fact, if you look at the science at the time, the ethologists were arguing for the deprivation experiment. This was uh, promulgated by Lorenz and others. Aranis Eibel Eibelsfeld, the noted uh, European ethologist, has a criteria for doing deprivation experiments. And one of the things he stated was that you only want to disrupt the adaption that you're going to study. And Harlow wiped out everything. He put them in these uh, wire cages with uh, these wire things that he referred to as um, surrogate mothers and wiped out all experience, creating, if you will, insane, crazy monkeys. If you want to look at rhesus macaque maternal behavior, then all you have to do is deprive them of experiencing any of that. And you could do that by having them raised by humans, giving them care, contact, love, affection, but not doing it the way a rhesus does it. Or later on, some uh, of the researchers used dogs as surrogates, and they didn't get the damage that Harlow did, but they didn't, of course, have a chance to uh, experience any learning from uh, rhesus macaques. So is it the case that Harlow didn't need to do these studies because John Bowlby, with his work on attachment, was already looking at uh, these sorts of things and the importance of the relationship between the infant and the carer? Well, it depends what you take as an evidence base because Bowlby's work was based around what at the time he called juvenile delinquency, finding that in the histories of so-called juvenile delinquents there tended to be mother absence. Now, that's one form of evidence, but what you can't say is whether all young men who have an absent mother become juvenile delinquents. It's the wrong sort of reasoning, so it's not a, a wholly supportable evidence base. The research that was going on by René Spitz and others in orphanages, which was around that sort of time, was more quasi-experimental and showing a link, but it's a different sort of evidence provided by experiments such as Harlow's. Today, a lot of people say that Harlow's experiments were cruel and, and too cruel to have been done. What would have been the view at the time? Well, it's documented that even at the time, people were shocked at what he was doing and felt it went too far. Even Harlow himself said, and this is a direct quote, we began as sadists trying to produce abnormality. Some animals were kept in deprived conditions for years and years and years, weren't they? Some were isolated for 15 years. What the benefits are of that is very hard to say, since um, deprivation for even a matter of weeks produces robust effects, if you want to describe it in those terms. You probably would not normally see dumbwaiters like this elevators, one that says monkeys only, and another that says freight only. So they transported the monkeys at the dumbwaiter to take them upstairs and downstairs? Well, and to this day we still do, because in order to bypass the human floor, we have monkeys living below us as well as above us, the 500 to be exact. The way they transit from floor to floor is in their own monkey elevator. There is a slight smell. Slight is the word. Back then, you would have been hit with a wave of monkey odor. There wouldn't have been a feeling that it was wrong to use rats, mice, or monkeys in research in the 1950s, early 1960s, when this 
was done. And that came later. It was the realization that monkeys were intelligent, that they were sentient beings, that the realization that monkeys had emotions, that they needed to bond to others, that actually led up to the compassion and the concerns and some of the rules we have today. So ironically, some of the experiments that get criticized were actually the ones that alerted us to the significance of these issues. Whether or not Harlow ended up benefiting experimental animals long term, and you certainly couldn't do that kind of deprivation experiment today, the fact remains that these experiments were done on rhesus monkeys, not people. So can we really generalize and say that the same would happen with babies? Unfortunately, there have been situations in the world where they have done that experiment on babies, which is the sad case of what happened in Romania, where we saw those children in orphanages in the late 80s and early 1990s. Those kids were in very bad shape. So I would say in this case, the findings do extrapolate quite well from the monkey to the human, but not everything that animals do is identical to us. When you worked with Dr. Harlow, did you see the setup of the wire monkeys and the cloth monkeys? That had all gone by then. However, I will tell you that in the graduate student office, there was a huge, and I mean about five foot high, cloth surrogate. So we could all go over and hug the surrogate when we were <laughs> feeling the stress. Really funny. Melinda Novak, Harlow's former student. Helen Leroy used to be Harlow's assistant. He didn't think that monkeys should be pets and the people that worked here were not to make them pets. And even though there was not a lot of regulation of animal care, he was very concerned about the welfare and well-being of the monkeys. So there was a manual of procedures and these animals were given nutritious diets with vitamins and they were really well cared for without a governmental agency looking over the shoulder. So we've talked about his experiments. What about Harry Harlow, the man? Well, he, he was certainly a lively character, and he was able to bring together a collection of people here, really great people. He allowed them to develop on their own. I especially appreciated the fact that when you went in to talk to him, he listened, he had very good ideas, and he gave me, and also Steve Sumi. So Steve Sumi was another of Harlow's students at the time, and now heads a big primate research center himself. We would talk to him about ideas, and then he gave us a lot of independence, which I truly appreciated. He was not overbearing. He was not dictatorial. Power was not important to him. It was never a division of, I am the boss here and you're the workers. He'd come in in the morning and have coffee with the janitors. He had started out as an English major before he got interested in psychology. And I think a lot of people were able to appreciate his work because he was able to communicate it. He was really a communicator. We receive 100 letters a week from people throughout the world asking his opinion of things and how they might deal with a problem. They might have an idea and what did he think of their idea. He'd reply to all of them. I mean, he was very open with exchanging information and communicating with people. That's what I always really loved about him. Some of the best research in the social sciences is challenging. It challenges ethics frameworks and it challenges methodological frameworks. Some of the best research is right at the edge. And at the time, Harlow's experiments were close to the edge. Obviously, one thing Harlow shows how important touch and affection and contact is. Do you think that there's any sense today that people are afraid of touching children so much now? You know, that there's been so much talk of, of abuse and so on that people are afraid of innocent contact? Well, I have quite a lot to do with early years settings and primary schooling settings. And over the last eight to ten years or so, there's been what, in my view, is a really negative move towards suspicion of contact between staff and children. When children are distressed, when they have an injury, the approach now is not to cuddle 
not to comfort through bodily contact, not to sit the child on the lap and help them to feel better and get over it. While I recognise the need to protect children from inappropriate contact, going too far with banning contact, I think, puts children in earlier settings and in primary schools in a very difficult position. What sense are they to make of adults who are responsible for them, who are not comforting them when they're distressed, when they're hurt? John Oates at the Open University. It's obviously a fine line to tread, protecting children from inappropriate intimacy while retaining the importance of the appropriate physical contact that Harry Harlow demonstrated half a century ago. But according to Christopher Coe at the Madison Primate Lab, that's far from Harlow's only legacy. For a couple of decades, this was the mecca, the place to come to if you wanted to do developmental research with primates. So that's a sort of another testimony of how much impact does a scientist have, was how many of their academic offspring go on to do meaningful things. And so I would say he had a huge influence within the United States on the next generation of people who did behavioral studies and neuroscience studies um, with primates, which then in turn influenced my generation, because I'm one generation removed from Harry Harlow. How much you feel that Harlow has influenced you with your centre here? And then there's Steve Sumi heading a primate research centre now as well. Oh, I think he had a tremendous influence. From my perspective, I probably wouldn't have been working with monkeys had it not been for him. Steve, you'd have to ask him, but I think he would say that Harlow had a, an enormous impact on his life. And if you look at the directions he's undertaken, the study of individual differences, gene environment interactions and the like, that all follows directly from Harry's work. So if you stand on this corner, you can get a feel for what he created within his one career. First, this part of the building and then there was the addition added to it but then soon thereafter within a couple of years he added those two buildings as well which is what's called the primate center so it's almost like he had an entire street built so essentially yeah and in fact we're planning in the near future to enclose this and make it into a research park as a man's accomplishment within the scope of one lifetime to have created all of this not too shabby not too bad not bad at all yeah Clearly, his work has paved the way for us knowing what normal behavior is, what kinds of abnormal behavior to look for, how to house animals. Harlow gave us some information that was crucially important, but we don't stop with that. We're constantly improving and refining and correcting and modifying. To say that children are raised in a better way now than they had been in the 1940s and 50s is a consequence of a single set of experiments done in monkeys in Madison, Wisconsin. I would be thrilled if even one study by the time I'm done with my career has a fraction of that impact.